Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, we're here to talk about utility commissions, processes, and structures. And um, I want to thank you all for joining. This um, we're, we joke about this topic not being the most lively, but um, you know you're going to listen. You're going to hear from two lawyers, uh, me and from Camille Kadosh, and um, hopefully we're going to make this uh, make this presentation interesting for you. Um, we're going to break it up. We're going to ask for your questions uh, over the course of the presentation. So, um, so there'll be a little, little movement um, and a little, uh, little change up, so to speak. This is the outline for how we uh, plan to proceed today. Um, we want to talk about why there is such a thing as utility regulation. We're going to give you a little brief history because that's sort of uh, that's going to anchor things to um, in in a legal context that applies all over the U.S. and will um, allow you to sort of connect to to your state and the the areas that where you work. We're going to talk about industry structure a little bit, and um, then we'll start talking about regulatory commissions broadly. There's a federal. Energy Regulatory Commission, of course, there are a bunch of different state utility commissions. And then we'll go down, drill down a little more deeply into what PUCs um, actually do. And, and then the, the last part of this presentation, we'll be looking at participating in the process, um, which uh, we hope is um, especially uh, useful to you folks. Um, I wanna point out that you're gonna hear things repeated. We intend to circle around these topics and so if, if you're sort of thinking, well, wow, they just mentioned that, um, you're going to find a number of topics that, um, that we repeat because um, we think it's, it's important uh, to, to hit on certain points and to, um, to emphasize them for you. Just as um, by way of encouraging you all to look at a resource, the more you want to, if you want to get into this in more detail, this is uh, a document that comes, uh, comes out of wrap. Um, this is a second edition. We think we need to do a third edition, but basically it looks at electricity utility regulation in the US. Now you may think, wow, that would be deadly, um, but it's not because what it does is take discrete topics and, and it looks at them like in four pages or five pages. So you can use this as a reference manual. If you're interested in specific topic, you can find it and, and get sort of a bird's eye 10,000 view, uh, 10,000 foot view kind of um, on, on specific topics. If you are interested in a, in a hard copy, let us know and we can we can get you one so you can put it by your bedside. So let's uh, let's start digging into the purpose of utility regulation. Um, what's the point of regulation? Well, the thing is we're dealing with natural monopolies and, and natural monopolies, that's an in industry um, that has technology a technological aspects or economic aspects that are such that it makes sense to only have one provider providing the services that they provide uh, instead of having a bunch of different providers. The example folks give oftentimes is, you know, having different wires going down the street. It makes sense to have just one set um, because that's going to be the lowest cost for society and, um, will allow for um, the best service that um, ideally is, is available. Um, electric utilities provide essential services. We only need to look at um, recent history in Texas, for example, to see how essential these services are. People have lost their lives in freezing weather. People lose their lives in really hot weather. And these services are, are, are really important to us. You'll, you'll hear me say a couple times that the reason you have public utilities is the same reason you have a fire department. We all need this. This is just sort of a basic, uh, a basic element of um, society that we live in. You're going to hear this term uh, public interest. We regulate monopolies because they're affected with what we call the public interest. Yes, they need to bring in money so they can operate but they're there like the fire department's there. They're there for public purposes. So why do we regulate these utilities? Well, you know that if you have a monopoly that runs by itself, what it's going to do um, is behave in ways that's just not helpful. Um, and 
it, they're going to behave in ways that are self-serving. Monopolies restrict the output. They restrict the services that they provide. They set prices higher than might be economically justified. And so you have regulation imposed on monopolies to, to mitigate those problems. So it's the general duty of a regulator to ensure that, you know, uh, electric, electric service is safe and that it's uh, as reliable as possible, that it's adequate and that it's priced, <clears throat> excuse me, that the price that is charged for these services um, is sufficient for the utility to fulfill its obligations but it's not so expensive that it's uh, that it's unfair for uh, consumers. Is that successfully um, is that ideal successfully rolled out? Well, that's obviously debatable, but that's that's the purpose of regulation. So the idea of regulation assumes that you have monopolies, but it's there to mitigate that um, that monopoly power. Just one final point about why we regulate. When you have rules, you create incentives. And so there's a term referred to as uh, performance-based regulation. It's considered incentive regulation. But any regulation of utilities creates certain incentives and disincentives. Uh, we joke sometimes that utility regulation is sort of like the, the sort of rules that you have to impose to make sure your kids behave. Think about kids at bedtime. It's bedtime. Time to go to bed. Well, I need to brush my teeth. Okay, you got to brush your teeth. I need to go to the bathroom. Will you read to me? Will you leave the light on? So anytime you create rules, you create an incentive to you know, go around those rules. And so any set of regulations is going to impose incentives. So when you think about imposing a rule, um, it's important to take the next step and ask yourself, so what sort of behaviors are going to result from those rules that you're imposing? Before I move ahead, I just want to ask if there are any general questions uh, ab about these sort of general observations I've just provided. We have none, then I'm just going to hand it off to Camille. All right. Thank you, Dave. Thanks for that intro. I'm next gonna talk about um, just a few takeaways. Dave, if you, could, if you could hit the next slide about some of the things that we just talked about. At the end of each of these sections, we'll do just a brief takeaways of things that you should remember from each section. And Dave talked that it's uh, it's a essential service, heating, cooling, water, sewer services. Those are essential services that we need and they serve the public. And the regulation helps to regulate these big entities that are natural monopolies so they don't forget that public service element of what they're there to provide. So in general, utility regulation is going to look at a few things. It's going to make sure that what is provided by these utilities is safe, it's adequate and reliable, um, and that it is sufficient but no more than sufficient to recompense the cost of providing that service. So that is the purpose of why um, utilities are regulated. Next slide. We wanted to give you a little bit of a history of the regulation, and we're trying to trying to keep this lively and interesting as well. But the history and um, some of the grounding of it really helps us to understand why it was structured as it was and to understand what might need to be um, modified to change it as well. So we're going to go into that history a little bit. And actually, the first regulation, believe it or not, came from medieval England when we were talking about inns. Um, and the regulation was that no inn uh, could turn away people who came to their door seeking a room unless they were unruly or difficult. Um, but that was the first regulation of something that was providing a public service, businesses that were affected with the public interest. And this basis in regulation is what is um, what is carried through today to say, okay, what are other businesses that are affected with the public interest, which includes railways, includes utilities, includes other things that have been added to this analysis of things that really affect the public. And the prices have also been regulated as well to say, 
this needs to be, because it's affected the public interest, it needs to be something that is accessible by the public. Um, and that is due to the monopoly structure that we have in place for many of these large entities. Next slide, please, Dave. Thanks, Camille. So, so we're gonna talk about a few constitutional law cases that, that inform, that, that sort of set the framework for, for what we're talking about here today, utility regulation. I think of the grandmother of all utility regulation cases is Munn v. Illinois. 1877, but it still holds true today and is still quoted in um, in Supreme Court cases. So here are the facts. Basically, back in, in the, the late 19th century, you have farmers growing grain and they bring it to the railroad. And then the railroad brings it to the cities. And that's this sort of chain, this network of, um, of sales. But what's right in the middle are the grain elevators, and they worked as a bottleneck, and they were determined to be a monopoly service. And um, this issue came up um, uh, before the uh, Supreme Court. They were charging monopoly prices to farmers. That was considered uh, unfairly. Camille's used the expression affected with the public interest. That's a, a term that was taken from medieval times in, in England. So Constitutionally speaking, the first Supreme Court case said that property that's devoted to public purposes, like utility property, isn't subject to the same takings analysis as private property. Now, what do I mean by takings analysis? The Fifth Amendment to the Constitution says no one can be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. It's it's the it's what's called the due process clause. It's in the U.S. Constitution, uh, in the Fifth Amendment, and then the Fourteenth Amendment said states you have to do the same thing. So for the government to get involved in taking property, which would be a utility company's rates, to be really simplistic, um, they have to observe certain processes um, to to make sure that um, this is done fairly and and doesn't run afoul of the Constitution. So Munvi, Illinois basically said, yep, that's private property, but it's affected with the public interest. So it's not just private, and we're going to treat it a little differently. I'm going to add two more uh, cases that are important here. These are all important decision points that form the basis of regulation and how um, utility regulation is structured. And these are called Bluefield and Hope National Gas, if you want to know the 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 technical case names, but what they stand for is talking about prudent investment. So utilities are allowed to earn a regulated annual rate of return on the rate base if it's prudent. And so determine if it's a prudent investment, the, the Public Utility Efficient uh, Commission will see if the costs were reasonable at the time that you incurred the costs. And if given the circumstances of what was known at the time that you incurred the costs, um, and if it was reasonable given the circumstances at the time, I'm sorry, I got ahead of myself there. So is it reasonable at the time it was occurred given the circumstances that were knowable? So that's if it's prudent. The second part of it here is if it's just and reasonable um, from the customer and the utility perspective. So rates need to be sufficient to allow the utility to attract additional uh, capital under prudent management because they are still a business. Um, and so the rates that they set that are able to recover the costs need to be enable them to recover, um, to be able to attract investment in, in them as well. Many utilities are investor owned utilities um, in the US as well. Dave. Thanks, Camille. So Camille's just sort of set out the basis for um, justifying how utilities earn their earn their income. Rate bases are the things that utilities invest in, like wires and um, you know substations, things like that. Um, this one case called Market Street Railway is a really interesting case because it sort of puts a cap on um, it, it, it character it, it puts a cap on what utilities, can earn, um, and and the Market Street Railway case um, basically says that utilities don't get to recover all their stranded costs. Now, what's stranded costs? Well, these are 
this is utility speak, but if this just were a private company, it's, you know, bad investments. You know, I invested, I, I invested in this building, but nobody comes to my restaurant. Well, too bad. Stranded costs, you you lose. Well, for a utility, they say we want we want the ratepayers to cover these investments. And Market Street Railway was a case that looked at streetcars in San Francisco that were um, they were facing uh, competition from basic just you know taxi cabs. People were taking more taxi cabs than they were taking streetcars. Well, the utility said it needed a rate increase. And the regulator said, you know, we're not going to give you a rate increase just because you can't get ridership and because you're facing competition. So they said in court, the, the utility said that the rate, um, I'm sorry, the streetcar company said, uh, you've denied us our rate increase. And that's an unconstitutional taking, right? Under the due process clause. And um, the Supreme Court said, no, we're not, the regulator doesn't need to justify your poor investments. If you can't keep your ridership, if your business model just doesn't work anymore, um, it's not the ratepayer's job to, to bail you out. So there's sort of limits on these, on this ability to, um, to get recovery. I'm gonna stop here and see if folks have any questions. I hope this has been clear, but if not, this is the time to raise it. You gotta be quick on the button or we're just gonna forge ahead. Yeah, Dave, the only question I've seen so far in the chat was uh, folks asking if uh, these slides would be available uh, after the presentation, but I don't think we have any questions on content yet. Great, thank you, Jacob. Uh, yeah, we'll certainly make these available. So let's just um, just go over what we're looking at. Utilities are private property, right? Especially investor-owned utilities, right? They're paying shareholders. Um, they're paying dividends to shareholders, right? So they're private companies in that sense, but they're affected with the public interest. So they don't get to do just what they want. They're subject to regulation. The Constitution um, <clears throat> imposes certain limitations. Um, on regulators so they don't unjustly take in the name of government um, utility property, uh, this takings question, all right? Um, they're entitled, companies are entitled to um, get returns um, similar to the returns that a private company facing comparable risks uh, would be able to get. Like Camille said, they have to be managed prudently. They have to be managed reasonably. Um, and companies are not protected from technological evolution. I'm going to hand it back to you, Camille. All right. Thanks, Dave. And I think you can go to the next slide as well. So having talked about the structure for regulation, the precedent for it, and why we're regulating these entities, we're going to talk a little bit about the utilities that they regulate and how they are structured uh, in general. So there's there's a couple of different structures for utilities. About 35 states in the US have vertically integrated utilities. That means that they provide the generation, the transmission and the distribution to, in order to provide uh, power to customers. They are also able to, instead of using their own assets and generating power, they're also able to buy it in the market. Um, across the US, there's a bunch of different power markets that are mostly regionally um, formulated and they are not everywhere in the U.S. Um, there's different parts of the West and the Southeast that do not have power markets, um, but they're also, um, they are exist in much of the U.S. Um, they also may buy power through contracts from others uh, without being in the market. Then in some parts of the U.S., you have distribution-only utilities. They don't own any generating resources. So they buy all of their power from either wholesale providers um, or in some restructured uh, states, they're able to buy directly from the suppliers as well. And some of these alternative suppliers that we've talked about, um, this is renewable energy suppliers, uh, uh, alternative suppliers, cogeneration, gas, et cetera. Um, and this was enabled by the public utility Regulatory Policies Act, what we call PERPA, which required utilities to 
purchase the output from qualifying generators. And so there, those are, um, that is what that section of utilities is. So generally vertically integrated distribution only utilities and then alternative suppliers that are able to provide power as well. Next slide, please. Um, there's various types of um, utilities in the US as well. There's investor owned, which is currently about 75% of all um, all provision of power comes from investor owned utilities, but there's also publicly owned utilities. So this includes uh, municipal government uh, entities type things as well. And then there's electric cooperatives as well. And if you were to layer this map one over, one over another, you would see that it um, in every part of the US, you were able to get power from one of these entities as well. So it's quite diverse how, uh, how people get to power and from which entities. Next slide, please. We talked a little bit about wholesale versus retail. Um, and when you purchase your electricity from your utility company or from your retail electricity provider, that's called retail electricity. So that's in, slide, in sections four, steps four through six in this graphic. These companies and other entities sell and purchase electricity in the wholesale market, um, which is steps one, two, three in this graphic as well. Dave, turning it back to you. Thank you, Camille. So industry structure, pretty, pretty basic stuff, but it's important to recognize that there are lots of, uh, lots of different structures. Um, IOUs are, uh, predominate um, before PUCs. There's a lot of lot of the work that regulators do involves investor-owned utilities. Some states regulate co-ops and some states regulate municipals, but typically not. That that governance and regulation is done at um, you know at the board level um, in, in those cases. And remembering that power is sold at the wholesale level and the retail level is important because that sort of matches the, the structures that we're going to be talking about. So let's, uh, we're talking about regulatory commissions and um, we're talking broadly at this point about regulatory commissions. In a few minutes, Camille's going to talk about state regulatory commissions, public utility commissions. I'm going to talk about federal commissions really quickly. I don't think they're going to, um, <clears throat> I think having this general background for you is good to know. Um, please don't feel you have to get hung up on the details a whole lot. It's just good to know that there, there's activity at the federal level and at the state level. So let's just look at this term called federalism. I think it's helpful to understand the relationship that sometimes isn't really that clear, the relationship between state and federal government. Um, the term federalism describes this relationship, and it's kind of, it's, it's depending on the context, it's quite different. For example, uh, if you looked at the Clean Air Act, which is a federal statute, the Clean Air Act tells EPA to develop standards for air pollution, like on NOx and SOx, CO2, that sort of thing. But the states have the job of implementing those programs that relate to those pollutants. If you look at worker safety, OSHA programs, that's entirely federal. There are no state programs. Uh, they're, they're completely preempted. So the federalism sort of relationship um, can be different. Um, typically, under the Constitution, if the federal government's not doing it, whatever it is, states often pick up uh, pick up the reins and and run with the topic. But let's talk about electricity. How does this federalism idea work in the context of um, electric regulation? Like I said, I'm going to talk about the federal side of it before Camille goes to the state side. Um, what folks call the FERC, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission focuses on wholesale. Remember we were talking about wholesale real, retail? They focus on wholesale power sales that are in interstate commerce. Um, they That's for electricity, for natural gas, they do pipelines, uh, storage facilities. Uh, 
liquid natural gas, liquefied natural gas that, that gets exported uh, and imported into this country. Oil pipelines, um, they certify those qualifying facilities that Camille mentioned. Remember she said they're vertically, um, vertically organized utilities and then those that just do retail sales and they're those that just do generation. Well, FERC regulates those, those facilities. Um, and it, it's responsible for the reliability of what we call the bulk power system. That's the whole, wholesale, um, the wholesale, the big wires that go interstate. What does FERC not regulate? Well, it doesn't do local electric distribution or the rates associated with it. Um, it doesn't do local generation, generation that somebody in your state wants to build with one exception, and that is hydroelectric dams. It doesn't do transmission that's being built in your state um, for local purposes. And it might do uh, wholesale recovery for activities in your state, but that's just sort of a, a wonky thing we don't really need to get into. So what does FERC do? How does it take action? You're gonna hear a term, um, a couple times today at least, it's quasi-judicial. This is, FERC works sort of like a court system, okay? Like PUCs do. They, they work like a, a, a judicial system and they hear cases, but sometimes they um, just do workshops or just make rules, do rulemakings. That's more like a legislative sort of process. But FERC takes actions, um, industry-wide actions, it does, this sort of workshop approach to things. It does rulemakings. It issues policy statements. What are things that are, are useful steps um, for companies that it regulates um, and activities it regulates, um, useful steps that could apply to those contexts. And like I said, it's quasi-judicial. It does specific adjudications for uh, companies and customers and other market participants that it's involved with. So like I said, this isn't your primary focus here today, but we wanted you to sort of have that background. So are there any questions at this point? <laughs> well, that was the only question. Oh, yeah. I've answered a couple in the chat, but I don't see any other outstanding ones unless somebody wants to volunteer one now. Okay, well, Camille, the mic's yours. All right, thank you. So we're finally getting to PUCs, Public Utility Commissions, Public Service Commissions. Um, they're called different things in different states. And it's not just the 50 states that have Public Utility Commissions. It's also Washington, D.C., Puerto Rico, Guam, and the Virgin Islands. Um, and RAP is global. And we are frequently asked questions from other uh, places around the world about how things are regulated in the U.S. Um, and this broad diversity of public utility commissions across more than 50 states here, right, um, means that it's a broad answer. There's quite a few different ways that things are done. So trying to talk generally about how things are regulated across utility commissions is, you know, take that with a little bit of a grain of salt, but it's also interesting to see the broad diversity of things that uh, can be accomplished across the U.S. depending on which jurisdiction that you are looking at. Uh, next slide, please. So for this section, we're going to talk about structure and organization of PUCs, how they function, how they're um, what their powers are, and how different utilities are structured underneath them as well. Next slide, please. So the structure and organization, each public utility commission has between three to seven uh, commissioners that are either elected or appointed. We'll talk about that in a minute. And then they are supported by professional staff. So while the commissioners will cycle out according to their term, the professional staff generally um, is professional staff and that's their job and they generally stay and are able to support the work of the commission. And so the professional staff do things to keep things running, like conducting hearings, they do rate filings, analyzing rate filings, they help enforce the rules and tariffs, they provide technical assistance to the commissioners um, 
as advisory staff. They have attorneys, so they have a legal analysis on some sections. Um, they also do policies. They might have policy staff for their legislative and reporting functions that are part of that as well. And then they also try to facilitate things through alternative re dispute resolution process. How this is structured within each state, how the policy staff interacts with the um, with adjudicative staff, uh, et cetera, will vary quite a bit uh, state to state. But in general, these are the things that they do and this is how the commissions operate. Next slide, please, Dave. I said that the commissioners could be appointed or elected. Um, in most states, um, about three quarters of them, commissioners are appointed by the governor and then confirmed by the legislature. But in some states, uh, the commissioners are elected in a in a general election, um, and then by the general population, and sometimes by the legislature, they will also um, confirm them. Um, most commissioners serve terms that are four to six years. They are generally staggered, so you don't have everybody go on or off at one time. And there's in some states there are limits to how many consecutive terms a commissioner may serve. Um, however, I just saw a recent chart that for those states that don't have those limits, um, there are some commissioners that have served in place for 30 years. Many of them cycle on and off, however, though. Next slide, please. PUCs have limited powers. Their, their power is granted by statute, and it is defined by law, and there's the decisions that they make are subject to appeal within the state courts. And those reviewing courts will generally defer to the decision of the commission because the commissioners have specialized knowledge and might have had specialized, um, might have specific reasons for how they ruled on a decision. And generally the judicial courts defer to that. They will, however, reverse it if they believe that they exceeded their statutory authority. Remember I said it's defined. Um, if they think they misinterpreted the law, again, that's a judicial purview to interpret the law. So if they think the commission misinterpreted that, they might overturn what the commission did. Or if they conducted an unfair process, according to the process steps that are set out in law. Um, the enabling statutes for commissions generally focus on economic regulation. Think about all of those cases that Dave and I cited earlier on. It was focused on the economics of it, because that is the, generally the structure, how it focused originally was to make sure that the prices were fair. So most of the enabling statutes for commissions focus on if the rate is just, reasonable, and sufficient. Remember, those are the same words that were directly from that Supreme Court uh, decisions. They want to determine if it is reasonable, safe, adequate, and sufficient service. Um, and they also want to make sure that the processes that the, that the commission follows, that those are adequate and reasonable standards, rules, practices, and that those are able to set reasonable services. So these are limited powers. Next slide, please, Dave. And this is an example of one aspect of this. This is from a Nehruk publication. Uh, there's something called the National Associated of Reg Association of Regulated Utility Commissions, um, and this body put out this uh, analysis of the limited powers of utility commissions. Now note that this shows consideration of non-energy economic impacts in state statutes. This isn't even talking about non-energy benefits that might include health or environment or things like that. But this is just looking about the extent to which, in statute, public utility commissions have the ability to consider non-energy economic impacts. And it's mixed. Some of those statutes are very constrained, and they can really only look at the economic impacts. Others, maybe, that's in the green, they might have partial consideration where they're enabled to look beyond just the economic areas. Um, and some have quite a bit more but it is varied across the US. Next slide. Um, somebody asked about public power um, and 
uh, or public versus private. Mm -hmm. And the terms kind of vary here a little bit. There's consumer owned utilities, sometimes called public power utilities. Um, and this is generally municipal utilities. Um, think about towns that have their own, uh, we call it muni, muni, municipal utility, and they are generally subject to a city council or a special board or committee that governs how they operate. Um, public power districts are um, typically out west, some other places as well. They also have generally have dedicated or electric boards. Um, and electric cooperatives also generally have boards and membership as well, but who, that is governed by a board who are able to vote um, and govern what they do. Some state utility laws apply to these guys, um, and they generally apply to things like notice requirements for rate adjustments. Uh, state law might apply to that. The public utility might over public utility commission might oversee that. Some. Public utility commissions might oversee resource portfolio requirements or planning requirements of municipalities or cooperatives. And it might be different. Some might oversee municipalities, not cooperatives, vice versa. It varies greatly state to state um, to the extent to which the public utility commission uh, oversees this group. Next slide, please. Okay, Camille, thanks. I guess we, we'll stop here and, and see if there are questions. Yeah, we do have one question in the Q and A, and I, I apologize; it doesn't tell me who who asked it. Um, but there was a question of any of do any of the just, reasonable, and sufficient standards take into account uh, things like race, income, or any other conditions that may negatively affect people? Um, you know, what's typical of that uh, across different states? Camille, would you like to take that or you want me to go? So it's it's a great question. And, and I think the answer, um, the best way to answer is to, to consider the language uh, associated with that standard. And some people think that um, the idea of just and reasonable is just so vague that a utility commission can decide anything is just or reasonable or sufficient. Now that can be good. I think that's correct, actually. It gives all sorts of leeway to a, a commission because they're gonna take evidence and um, they're going to hear argument and they're gonna make their decisions based on specific circumstances that they experience in a case, for example. So they may determine that something isn't just and reasonable for some of the reasons that were just mentioned. Customers are incapable of paying, uh, paying bills or customers have been unfairly treated by a, a company. And so they, you know, the utility commission has the leeway to say, well, under these circumstances, these rates are not just and reasonable. Um, but likewise, uh, you, a utility commission has the ability to, um, make a determination that one might not agree with based on you know, your interpretation of the facts and the arguments that you've heard. You may say, well, those aren't just and reasonable, but the commission has that, that leeway to make a determination. So it's um, the, the answer is to your question is yes, those things can be included, but they don't necessarily need to be included. I, I hope that's a clear answer and Camille, Straighten me out if I'm if I've run off the rails on that one. No, I think that's correct. And I guess the short answer is it depends. Um, and if you think back to that map that we showed earlier, the extent to which it can be non-economic considerations will vary by state. Some states have also layered on top other legislative uh, requirements or decisions that say you must consider this when you are setting rates. You must consider um other considerations um, when you're determining rate, when you're determining um, location of power plants, those types of things. But it will vary and it will depend. Can I ask a little bit of a leading follow-up question to that? Would, would you say then it's fair to say that the degree to which some of those factors do get 
taken into consideration with those standards is pretty dependent on who these commissions actually hear from on these different cases and dockets. Yeah. I think that's a large part of it. Um, not entirely, not entirely. And I'll just say that because um, it's still kind of nascent having a, a larger or broader um, group of people that participate in commission proceedings, right? There's, there's some of the usual suspects and it's starting to expand. States, because of legislative reasons or because they see this in their hearing rooms are starting to take more progressive steps on that as well. So it varies, but having more people participate and raise these issues is uh, hugely important to it be, being taken up. And we'll talk about that more as we talk about different ways, things that commissions need to react to and regulate on. Um, and that is definitely part of it. Dave, anything to add? I would just no. I think that's. I think your point is a really good one, Jacob. And I, I'd say yes, like Camille has has answered. But it also goes. Um, it has a lot to do with uh, the point that Camille made, um, and that is these courts are 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 uh, directed by statute to do certain things. So, for example, um, energy efficiency benefits may be looked at really narrowly by one state, but another state may have authority to say, well, we're going to look at um, comfort, you know, the comfort associated with a more, a more uh, better weatherized house, for example. In Vermont, for instance, they get to add a 5% adder to the value, the beneficial value of energy, of housing energy efficiency, um, just because they know that these things are hard to quantify. So they're just going to say, well, we're going to give you 5% extra. And we're going to give you the opportunity to provide more evidence to show that there's even that there are even more benefits. But like Camille said, it really depends on the statutory authority and where the commissions tend to um, stand on uh, any given subject. Uh, if there are no other questions, we'll just zip along here. So regulatory commissions, quick takeaways. This stuff is obviously can be pretty complex and bewildering, but remember there's a federal and a state jurisdiction. The rule of thumb is interstate will be federal, intrastate will be um, state-based. Uh, wholesale is federal, retail is typically state-based. These organizations, these commissions do rulemakings and legislative type stakeholder processes for, to articulate policy. They also adjudicate like a, like a court, like a state court. Um, commissioners can be appointed, they can be elected. And uh, the point I just made, they have limited power. So the statutory authority has a lot, um, has a lot to do with it. Um, Camille, back to you. Okay, so we've talked about the regulatory commissions, their structure. Now we're actually going to talk about what they regulate. So next slide, please. Um, we are talking here in the sense of talking about uh, utilities that provide electricity and gas. But it's important to keep in mind that public utility commissions also regulate telecom, water, and wastewater utilities. And importantly, um, from our perspective as well, the commissioners, remember we said there's anywhere between three and seven commissioners generally, they might have backgrounds in any one of those areas. Quite frankly, commissioners could also have backgrounds in none of those areas because they are elected or appointed, but they might have um, backgrounds in some of those other areas and not be as familiar with electric or gas regulatory areas. But that is part of the purview of the whole uh, regulated utility commission. And remember, we said they need to provide reasonable, adequate, and efficient services at a just and reasonable price. So that is the purview. And if you look at the mission statements of commissions across the country, you'll see those words repeated an awful lot. So they regulate and do this. They achieve this by looking at the prices that are charged. They look at the resource planning and acquisition decisions that the uh, utility makes to provide. Um, the, the services that they provide, and they look at how reliable it is and the quality of that service. 
um, sometimes there's different areas that the Public Utility Commission will intersect with, which again, varies quite a bit by states. But if you think of like permitting, like permitting for a new power plant or permitting for different types of things, that generally is partially maybe with the utility commission, also partially with other offices and state agencies throughout the state as well. So intersection there. Next slide, please. So again, we said that PUCs have a general authority to regulate in the public interest. And it's this interpretation of regulation in the public interest that varies. Because again, it comes with an economic analysis history. Um, which is starting to evolve as things, as the world gets more complicated, right? And as we look at more and more resources uh, in order to meet our needs. So they determine a utility's revenue requirement, which is establishes the rates that we pay for the different customer classes. And we are typically thinking here about residential rates, the prices that you and I play, pay for what we um get from utilities. However, there's also commercial and industrial classes as well. And I talked about the utilities power uh, choices of power sources. They also have purview over that. So there's different types of portfolio standards, which can be renewables. Um, it can be energy efficiency portfolio standards and other resources. There's something in most states called integrated resource planning which is wanting to be a long-term plan that the utility in, um, undertakes to be able to guide what they need to purchase, build, procure for um, to provide power to the customers of the future. And this is for energy efficiency. This is for generation, transmission lines, and distribution investments. So that's generally in integrated resource planning. Some states are starting to do something called integrated distribution system planning, which looks more at the as the distribution system is evolving to take into account more distributed generation resources as well. They're recognizing the need to plan for that as well and how that integrates into the system. Um, there's also construction authorization. So they have the authority to look at proposed power plants as well. And how that happens varies a little bit by jurisdiction. Next slide, please. So PUCs, in addition to those planning type things, they regulate this whole host of other things as well. Mergers and acquisitions of uh, utility companies which can be quite big. Their competitive activities, some environmental effects of utility activity. Some of that is regulated federally by the EPA or other agencies as well. Their accounting policies and practices, are those standardized? Are they clean, They're not messy? Um, resource planning that we've talked about, those service standards. Um, energy efficiency is something that most commissions regulate um, from utilities. Low income programs. Any issue assigned by the legislature, you know, they, they need to respond to that. And here also any issue brought by complaint. So we talked about the importance of having people involved. And so any issue that is brought by complaint by people who are um, served by utility commissions are also something that the PUCs regulate. So this is where voices are important. Next slide. And I remember earlier we were talking about prudent rates and prudent investments. This is also is prudence determinations for whether or not investment in big capital assets, small capital assets, but big assets generally like power plants, lines, et cetera, whether or not it was um, prudent at the time that they built it. And then at the end, the commission can determine whether or not um, that it was a sound managed practice, it was reasonable cost and with reasonable care. So a utility could build this and at the end, like a mission say, you know what? That wasn't really prudent. Rare, but has happened um, as well. So the determinations of whether or not something was in the public interest happens through a prudence determination as well. Next slide. <clears throat> 
Dave has said a couple of times, and you've gotten it from the, how many times we've talked about court cases here. And that's not just because we're both lawyers, um, but probably something to do with it a little bit. But uh, PUCs are quasi-judicial. They're also quasi-legislative when they do rulemakings. But they're judicial in the fact that when you have a rate case or another type of contested case, it follows very much a legal precedent here. There's a petition, you've got a docket, you've got an opening order, you have interventions and discovery, public hearings, testimony, cross-examination, um, those types of things where you develop a record and finally make uh, to make recommendations from staff, and then they might even consider motions for reappeal, et cetera. There's also a legislative aspect. If they make a rulemaking on some types of things, um, they will develop a draft rule, they'll publish it, they'll take public comment. Those are things that are more legislative in function, but they have both aspects within their purview. Dave. Thank you, Camille. So we're running, we're running um, out of the uh, out of time here. We're getting near the top of the hour. So I'm I'm just going to move right ahead. Um, and um, here are some takeaways, but just uh, check those out when you uh, take a look at the slides. So Camille, I think we ought to zip through this participation and regulatory process and hit on the on the high points points so we can tie things up uh, near the top of the hour. Back to you. All right. So now we're getting to the point where I think actually perhaps some of the most interest is here from this group about participating in the regulatory process and how you can do it. Remember I said at one point earlier that there's the typical parties that have historically been involved in public utility commission proceedings, which are listed here, including the companies themselves, consumer advocates, which are generally statutory, um, industrial energy users, various types of NGOs, and local governments. There's also increasingly third party providers, which might be solar providers or other uh, groups that provide energy, environmental groups, which might also be NGOs, environmental justice groups are now increasingly becoming involved in the uh, public in the public participation aspect, which is critically important. Next slide. Um, and it can take many forms. Um, one thing that I want to emphasize is that there's um, you can you can have paper proceedings, which might be just more technical types of proceedings that don't have public hearing type things or interested collaboratives. But there's also kind of some more generic policy type proceedings. So you might have something that is a rate case, which is very specific to a single utility. You might also have overarching policy dockets. Are they going to do interconnection standards across the state? Are they going to do public uh, performance-based regulation across the state? Those are generic policy type proceedings, um, which are important to be involved in as well. But there's different types and they might have different involvement proceedings. Dave? Thanks, Camille. So uh, Camille mentioned that there are, are the typical participants in a utility regulatory case, in an adjudication, or in a workshop. You know, the utility, the public advocate, it, you might have some industrial customers who don't want to pay a lot for electricity, who can afford to hire lawyers. Uh, and then you have environmental advocates, you have housing advocates, environmental justice advocates. Um, and oftentimes, uh, those folks who aren't statutory parties, that is uh, included by statute, by law in participation, they have to intervene in a case. And basically what that does is what requires uh, somebody to demonstrate in writing to the, the utility commission that they have an interest that's not being represented and that is um, important for the outcome of the case. So just a, a couple of observations here. Typically what happens in an adjudication or even in a workshop effort, there's a there's an order that goes out from the utility commission opening an investigation. I recommend that if you are thinking about intervening, that you take a look at that order opening an investigation. We've talked about PUCs being legalistic, being driven by their, their statutory authorization. Still, it's important. They're quasi-judicial. It's important to remember that they're political. 
So if you come in to intervene, or if you and a number of other parties come in to intervene, think about the political clout that you have. Think about the um, the topics that you want to see uh, represented. Um, when you look at that order opening investigation, who's being represented and who is not being represented? Ask yourself, what's your point of view? And is it um, going to be critical to the outcome of the case? Helping the Utility Commission understand that will help you uh, intervene in a case. In some states, not a lot, there's compensation for interveners. Usually it's a much tougher row to hoe. Uh, sometimes NGOs can afford to hire their attorneys. More often than not, though, you're going to team up with another NGO and maybe one or two or three of you get together and can hire an attorney. You may not need an attorney, but the, the point is that this is often an expensive undertaking and it's a bit, frankly, it's a barrier to good participation and representation. So being strategic about that, as I'm sure you all are, um, is, a, is a really uh, important consideration. You know, not all interventions need to be formalized. Not all, you don't know, need an attorney all the time. Um, in these informal policy dockets, you can participate. You're very knowledgeable. In fact, you may know more about the topic than a lot of the other folks there, than the utility company, than um, other advocacy groups, than the public advocate. So um, make sure that you um, don't uh, sell yourself short as far as your knowledge and, uh, and expertise. So I think at this point, we're not going to um, spend a lot of whole time with the takeaways. Just um, what we want to do is emphasize a few points um, before we hand it, out, hand it back to you all for questions. Uh, Camille? Um, so I guess, remember, I said that it, a lot of the PUC structures, mm -hmm. some of the things vary quite a bit by state. So this is where it's really critical to look how it's structured in your state, look at what the intervention proceedings uh, processes are, how you can engage. And I'd also uh, say that these are people, right? The, the regulatory staff, they're people that do these jobs and want to serve the public interest. So reaching out with questions is something that um, you should absolutely feel uh, empowered to do. Thank you. Uh, the next point here, prioritize public interest. Um, the PUC's job, when you look at it through an environmental justice lens, for example, um, the public interest is, is a broad formulation. Historically, environmental justice communities, frontline communities have been, have been excluded from this. There's plenty of evidence that there are structural barriers to participation, structural barriers to enjoying benefits associated with programs, structural barriers associated with uh, the economics. Um, it's important to recognize and, I, and, and emphasize that the public interest is what every utility commission has uh, the duty to uphold and to make sure that your concerns and your, this specific lens of environmental justice uh, fits into that public interest um, framework that utility commissions already have the legal authority um, and legal duty to uphold. They've talked about informal and former proceedings um, and you know different ways to participate in them. The formal ones requiring usually um, more uh, more money and time and effort um, and but um, potentially needing an attorney to be part of it. The informal ones, workshops, um, Less so. And I will just say that I had the great good fortune to facilitate a series of workshops in a Midwestern state recently and of um, one of these informal things that was a policy docket about things that would happen statewide. And of the 80 participants that were participating in it, 65 were from a low income advocacy group um, in this state and had great input and um participation that really formulated how we looked at some equity metrics in this state. So those are really important areas that people are able to participate in as well. Dave. So as far as intervention, we've just gone over the main points. I think I just want to emphasize that you have unique 
uh, experience and interests. And when you band together, your group can uh, demonstrate that. So be sure to um, not sell yourself short as far as the interest that you bring and the 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 understanding and um, value that you can bring to utility commission processes. With that, I think we're done. Sorry we ran over a little bit. Totally, totally fine. I think we had scheduled out folks for um, for a, an hour and a half. So thanks for folks for sticking around through uh, the whole presentation. And yeah, we're happy to uh, field more questions for David and Camille um, that you might have had. Uh, I see there was one uh, in the Q&A uh, that we hadn't quite gotten to yet um, that was pertaining to earlier in the um, presentation, uh, but they were just curious if you could elaborate more on what qualifying facilities are regulated by FERC. So we can start with that. And then, yeah, if folks have uh, other questions, please feel free to put them in the chat in the Q&A. You know, in, um, in, in the 70s, there was an oil, uh, they call it the oil crisis. And um, the United States recognized that it was um, being held hostage to international oil prices, and that, and they worried about access to that. That concern expanded to access to energy. So up till then, utility companies had been the only ones developing, you know, electric uh, uh, electric generation services, and um, folks were worried about that. Um, Congress was worried about that, so they passed a law um, that's called PERPA. Public Utility Regulatory <laughs> Something Act, I can't remember the P, but the point is what it did was open up things a little bit and say, look, there's money out there and folks can start generating electricity um, on their own and sell it to utilities. And that will give utilities more choices and it should help in lowering costs. And so what that federal statute um, did was articulate these these new non-utility generators as qualifying facilities, and and that law still is in play, and um, it's it's got a, it's got a long uh, long history, and actually most recently that law was used to require it doesn't require because it's a federal law telling states what to do. Remember this federalism thing? Uh, it says it told the federal law said to states we want you to consider time of use electricity rates when it comes to electric vehicles. Of course, they should be considering time of use electricity rates when it comes to any electrification, right? But um, that's how PERPA applies to quali qualifying facilities. Awesome. Um, well, I had a question, I guess, as you're going through. Um, you know, one barrier that we didn't touch on that much, um, especially when it comes to some of these um, more informal workshops and things like that, that might be a good opportunity for folks to engage is that um, they're just not very well promoted. <laughs> folks don't know about them when they're happening. Um, do you all have any you know, tips or best practices for groups to uh, make sure that you know, those types of events are crossing their radar when they're being offered by the PUC? Camille? We do, and I'm actually about to put the link, uh, a link in the chat on something that Dave uh, took the lead on writing, which was how to improve public access and participation at state agencies. Um, as we said, there's more and more states are looking at this and recognizing that a lot of the, a lot of the, the access provisions in place. Um, are, have their own barriers, the time of day, where it's located. Um, these are the people that participate are generally people whose job it is to participate in some way, shape, or form and are paid to do that. Not at the end of the day when people who would have to work are able to participate in it. That's a barrier. Language is a barrier. Uh, many different types of things provide are barriers to the ability for people to participate. Um, and so this uh, document articulates some of that and provides um, kind of a plan that we've provided to some states on how to improve that. 
Thanks for, for bringing that up, Camille. You know, Jacob, that's a really important um, it's a really important question, and and it can come up in any context. You know, how well did you guys advertise this meeting? How capable are folks of attending this meeting? Um, that just it's just a huge barrier. Um, I recommend that you uh, that folks consider in any context in which they're participating before um, uh, an administrative agency, utility commission certainly, but others, to add a section to whatever they provide in the way of comments saying, you know, thank you, it's been great to participate here, but have you considered making some of these changes to make this a little easier for folks to participate? Um, because we know that when, when it when it comes down to it, that um, how shall I put this? Um, it's not just uh, um, it, it's it's great to have uh, environmental justice communities participate. So it's not, but it's not just a matter of inclusion. It's it's essential if you want to achieve your energy goals, state X. Um, you need a program that's going to deliver those goals to communities of all levels. Uh, greater inclusion uh, in planning is going to yield better, more comprehensive initiatives uh, that are going to that are going to make sure they're going to help that um, they're going to help deliver benefits more broadly. So it's just it it's just gets right to the heart of the public interest. I, I, I just add another point here. Um, I've had arguments with friends about the need to emphasize that utility commissions, the, the public interest is really important to get at the environmental justice concerns. And somebody said to me, that's like saying all, all lives matter when somebody says black lives matter. And I don't agree with that. The all lives matter thing is just playing defense for all sorts of motivations folks can discuss. But as I've tried to emphasize today, and I think Camille has as well, utility commissions are required by law to represent the public interest. And it's gonna be the job of advocates in every context to say, you're not getting at everybody. Thank you for what you've done, but you could try a little harder. Will you consider doing these things? Yeah, yeah. Thank, thank you for that. Um, we do still have, you know, another ten or fifteen minutes uh, scheduled with David and Camille. So if you folks have questions, um, yeah, uh, still feel free to send those through. Um, well, we're waiting to see if we had any more questions. I had put the link in the chat, but I'll just remind folks um, that you can go to uh, the Midwest BDC website midwestdecarb.org slash calendar. Um, that will give you all of the other upcoming trainings that we have on our schedule. Uh, and just a reminder that this is uh, part one of three that we currently have uh, RAP uh, committed to do. So uh, this was some, some table setting of sort of the general field of play uh, with utility commissions in two weeks. Uh, we will come back with Megan and Mark from RAP to talk specifically about gas transition issues, which is obviously huge when we're talking about building decarbonization, um, how the utilities um, that currently deliver uh, fossil gas to buildings are thinking about their future and how utilities are, you know, steering them in, in certain directions. So that'll be in two weeks on uh, March 9th. And then at the end of March on the 23rd, um, Camille and David uh, touched on this idea of integrated resource planning and long-term planning for infrastructure uh, that utility commissions play a big part in. Uh, that session will be specifically on the fundamentals of utility planning and what types of considerations go into that. Uh, which is also huge for building decarb when we're talking about, you know, planning for a future where we're not hooking buildings up to natural gas anymore, 
and, and how do we make sure that the long-term plans of utilities are reflecting the need to transition off of you know what they've what they've planned for in the past. Uh, so again, that will be on the 23rd. You can find information about both of those sessions on midwestdcarb.org uh, slash calendar. And then bet between <laughs> today uh, and, and that second session, we also have a really exciting other session uh, with Emerald Cities Collaborative. Uh, Artie Griffith is gonna come in and talk to us about advocating for the Justice 40 principles that the federal government has set. How do we put pressure on the state and local levels to match that type of commitment as well? Uh, so if you saw Artie before at the Equity Summit, you know she's great. Uh, that'll be a really cool workshop. Uh, so I encourage folks to check that out as well. And now that I'm done plugging stuff, I'm gonna do just one last call for questions. Uh, before we say goodbye to David and Camille here. All right, well, if you um, log off and then kick yourself for not asking something, um, I think this is the start of a you know longer term relationship between Midwest BDC and RAP. Uh, so feel free to reach out uh, with your questions and we can definitely keep those lines of communication open. Um, and before we end it, any last thoughts from David and Camille before we uh, end the meeting? You know, I'd just like to say we, we really admire the work, work you all are doing. It's, it's, so, it's so important. And um, we are available. We're foundation funded. We're available for inquiries. If folks have questions, um, if they're trying to work through challenges, give us a whistle. We'd be happy to talk with you. We're available. As, and I'd like to echo that. We're happy to answer any questions you have. You can look on our website. We have a link in the slides that we will send you uh, a PDF of those as well. Um, Follow-up questions, we welcome those um, and really appreciate the work that you're doing. It's incredibly valuable. All right. Well, thank you, David and Camille, and thank you to all of our uh, attendees for joining us. Uh, sounds like in the chat, folks uh, found it useful. So uh, always good to hear that. Uh, and we'll uh, we'll see you all soon. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Thanks, Maggie. Thank you.